long chapter and my hair is blowing all over because the air conditioning up here is broke so I have a fan on <laughs> so it's everywhere okay this is a picture of the Moroccan home of the M family the Moroccan house of marbles on our way to Mr. M's house I asked Mr. F what the citizens of Krakatoa did with all their spare time you've told me that only families with ex creative interests were chosen by Mr. M to come here you said that people with inventive minds were selected because they would be less apt to be bored on a small island such as this well I asked how's it working out you have 19 days out of each month in which according to your constitution you have no work to do are you bored or have you interests here which keep you busy? We're kept busy here in much the same manner as people are kept busy in any country, except of course that the diamond mines which we own place our living on a slightly higher standard. Keeping busy in other countries is usually interpreted as earning a living. Earning a living means in its simplest form providing food and shelter. Our restaurant government takes care of our food needs. We have devoted our combined creative abilities to making our shelters as magnificent as possible. We build the houses which you see now one at a time. We choose a house for each represented country which we thought was most typically beautiful of that country and then went ahead and built it. For instance, my house is very much like the famous Petit Trianon in France. I bought the detailed plans of the Petit Trianon in a little shop in Versailles. We have the stones all cut to order in France and loaded them in our ship and brought them back to Krakatoa. These stones were all numbered and lettered corresponding to the plans. Building my house was as enjoyable to us as a huge set of toy blocks is to a young child. On subsequent trips, we bought suitable furniture. We all worked together until each house was completed. The builders supervised the actual construction. The painters either selected paintings, made copies of originals, or made paintings of their own for the houses. We handled, furnished, and decorated each house as a hobby. The fabulous hobby of the richest families in the world, which is what we happen to be. It has kept us working pretty hard. Is the food here always good, I asked, or do some families, either out of laziness or lack of interest, prepare poor meals on their days? No one seems to have slipped up yet. As soon as you start to run a restaurant, you become tremendously interested in food. I suppose that it is simply pride which makes one try to make better meals than the other families. You see, on your day, every family comes to your house to eat. I always find on F day that I am somehow trying to prove that my day is best. Then there's this to consider. We are all interested in food and we look forward to eating. If I were to prepare a poor F day at my house, I would have reason to fear that the others would do the same on their days and we would have a miserable month of food. I understand, I said. But then everything doesn't work out as neatly as I've made it seem, particularly now that our houses are all finished. To be sure, we work very hard on our day of the month, but recently we've spent considerable time in doing absolutely nothing at all. What's wrong with that? I hastily asked. Nothing, shouted Mr. F. I'm happy to see that you are a good loafer. Certain prudish people in other countries seem to find that busy hands are kept out of mischief or some other such silly idea. We've developed loafing on this island to such an extent, an expert extent, that even our hands are completely relaxed. Our only work now, besides cooking, is in trying to make life more pleasant for ourselves and for each other. The house you're about to see is one on which we have all been working lately. It was one. There's an alarm. Interesting. The house you're about to see is one on which we've all been working lately. It was one of the first to be completed and now we're all going over it with new improvements. If some of our inventions work in this house, we'll install them in our own houses. From the outside, continued Mr. F, you can plainly see that Mr. M's Moroccan house is of simple and solid construction. That is one of the main reasons why we chose it to work on first. It's easier to adapt new ideas to a house of simple rigid lines than it would be, for example, to a house with dom domes and minarets and towers, such as Mr. T's Turkish coffee house. We discovered right away that almost all of us had ideas of improvement that required some form of mechanical motive power. So we first of all made over the cellar of Mr. M's house. The usual cellars of our homes are filled with barrels of wine. We dug a separate cellar next door, lined it with the usual diamond boulders to make it sound and immovable, built a roof over it, and moved Mr. M's fine Moroccan wines into this new private cache. 
Most of our ideas required hydraulic pumps to put them in motion, so we first installed a steam engine in Mr. M's cellar. But here we are. Come, I'll take you to the cellar. We were greeted at the door by Mr. and Mrs. M and their children, M1 and M2. They hadn't had so many to things to talk about at breakfast, and they had, had reached their home long before we had. Mr. M sensed immediately that Mr. F was taking me on a tour of inspection of his house, so rather than complicate matters, he said that his house was ours for the morning and to feel free to wander through it and inspect it as we liked. I'll go downstairs and get some steam up, he said, in case you feel like trying out any of the inventions. We followed Mr. M down into the cellar. There was a boiler and a furnace which looked to me much like the equipment to be found in the cellar of any American home. And Mr. M told us that stoking the fire for the steam engine was no more difficult than keeping an ordinary furnace running. The room was well insulated because on a tropical island it would be impossible to live in a house heated by the sun above and a furnace below. Of course, the boiler was piped to the pistons of a huge steam engine. That was different from anything found in the ordinary American home. The rest of the cellar was an extraordinary maze of polished brass shafts running from the floor to the ceiling. The flywheel of the steam engine furnished power to operate numerous hydraul hydraulic pumps which evidently made these brass shafts go up and down. The steam engine was also attached to an electric generator. This whole cellar was sort of a mechanical jungle more complicated than the engine room of a ship. I was anxious to get out of there fast. First of all, because I was dying to see what all of this machinery operate upstairs. And then, too, there seemed little space in this huge room in which to move around without being burned, smeared with grease, crushed, or receiving electric shocks. Mr. F seemed to fi feel the same way about the room, and only Mr. M and M1 and M2 felt his home as they dashed around through this brass forest checking dials and gauges. I noticed as we were about to leave that two long white sheets of cloth were coming from a slit in the ceiling down into the cellar. These wide cloth bands passed through a sort of a large flat boiler, then on through what appeared to be the kind of drying machines used in paper factories, then back through rollers up another slit in the ceiling. What in the world is that? I asked. Come, said Mr. F. First, I shall show you Mr. and Mrs. M's bedroom. We walked upstairs and into a bedroom on the first floor. It was furnished in excellent Moroccan taste. I say excellent with some reservations. I personally am not too fond of that style. But aside from these observations, I noticed nothing unusual about the room at first. Have there been improvements made in this room? I asked. Mrs. M used to be a nurse, replied Mr. F, and to nurses, bed making seems to become extraordinarily boring after a while. If you stop to think of it, nurses in large hospitals spend a good deal of their time in making beds. It is natural that they should soon tire of it, particularly when they find themselves to be as rich as Mrs. M. We all came to Mrs. M's rescue with this amazing bed. It has continuous sheets. How does it work? I immediately inquired. Mr. F walked over to Mrs. M's bureau, opened the top drawer, and took from there a crank. He inserted the crank into a hole in the footboard of the bed and asked me to watch closely. He started to twist the crank and the sheet started to move across the bed, passing on rollers through a sideboard on through the floor. When I twist this crank, explained Mr. F, the sheets pass through the shipboard sideboard down through the floor into the cellar. There they pass through a boiler where they are washed, then through a drying machine. They next pass through steam heated rollers where they're pressed and then come up through the floor, through the other side of the sideboard on the bed on rollers and back to the top of the bed. This continuous sheet is marked off in bed widths. Every morning, Mrs. M simply turns the crank until a bed width has passed from one side to the other side of her bed. This action starts the washing machines, diverts heat from the furnace to the drying machine, and while one length of sheets is being pressed, fresh widths of hot white sheets are revealed on her bed. Incredible, I exclaimed. But what about blankets? Good Lord, man, said Mr. F. We never use blankets here. We're just a few miles above the equator. Oh, that's right, I said. Have you made inventions for every room in, the, in this house? We have. Each family originally chose a room to work on, although several families have worked on some rooms. We were all interested in the dining room. I'll show that to you next. You see, there are many problems attached to feeding 80 people, even if it's only once a month. There are four members to each family, and the children help a lot, but even so, you can well imagine that the problems of preparing an elaborate breakfast, clearing that off and preparing a lunch, getting that out of the way, and getting dinner ready are big and tiresome. What do you think of this dining room? he asked. I looked at the room we had just entered. It was enormous, but absolutely bare. The floor was highly polished and had sort of designs of discs on it, one large disc surrounded by four smaller ones. 
This design was repeated 20 times on the floor. The walls had pictures hanging on them, scenes of charging Arabs on horseback, and portraits of marabouts, sultans, and viziers. It looks more like a Moroccan ballroom of some sort, I asked. Where are the tables and chairs? Exactly, said Mr. F. It's easy to clean, eh, Professor Sherman? No tables to sweep under, no chairs to get in your way? Perfect, I answered. But what do you eat on? At this, a wild look came over Mr. F's eyes. Let me see if you can see that. There you go. Watch this, he said. He walked out in the hall and pulled a great lever. He came back to my side and took me over to the far corner of the room. Look at the floor, he said. I looked. There were suddenly small wisps and puffs of steam coming from the circular disks on the floor. Then these disks started to rise slowly like some nightmarish garden of mushrooms, and soon each group of disks was up out of the floor, forming little groups of four flat stools around little round tables. Cleaning up is easy here, he said. After M1 and M2 have removed the Tisha silverware and tablecloths, Mr. M lowers the chairs and tables by pressing the lever, and Mr. M and he, Mrs. M and he then wash the floor. Chairs, tables, and floors are all cleaned for the month in one motion. Bravo! What goes on in the other rooms of this Moroccan marvel house, I said. The living room isn't by any means perfected, he said, but I'll show you to it if you want to see it. Lead on. You see, explained Mr. F, lowering his voice considerably. Mr. P, Mr. Q, and Mr. R were poor but extremely inventive scientists when they were picked by Mr. M to come to Krakatoa. There are three of them are fascinated with the extraordinary power and many uses of electric current. It was they who insisted that the electric generator be attached to the already heavily burdened steam engine in the cellar. I think all their newfound wealth has gone a little to their heads. Mr. M wasn't awfully anxious to turn over his living room to them. He feels that their ideas are perhaps a little too advanced, even for Krakatoa. But what could he do? He had already given a room to each of the other families to work on, so he felt obliged to turn over the living room to these three remaining inventors. What in the world did they do to it? They electrified all the chairs and the couch, said Mr. F, in the hushed whisper of a man who's describing the work of a maniac. What for? I exclaimed hastily as I was about to enter the room. They say it's to move around the room more easily. I'll show you how they work. I wasn't too anxious to walk into this electric living room, but felt that it was safe to follow Mr. F wherever he went. The floor was made of steel. The chairs all had a decidedly unusual look about them. First of all, on the left arm of the chairs, they were all armchairs, there was a little tiller wheel, much like the tiller of a sailboat. The chairs were on little wheels. There was a rod up the back of these chairs with a sort of a steel brush on the end of it, which touched the ceiling, and the ceiling was covered with a wire mesh. The scientists who improved this room say that man spends too much effort moving his chair around the room or walking from his chair to the window, bookcase, or the table to get his pipe and so forth. They figured out that some men walk an unnecessary half mile a day just around the living room. These chairs are supposed to save people this trouble. Look, he said. He sat down in an armchair and drew the tiller around in front of him. I shall now move effortlessly around the card table and stop in front of the window. There's a button at the end of this tiller which I will press to start me off. I will steer the chair with the tiller and stop it by taking my thumb off the button. Are you ready? Go ahead, I said, backing into a corner. Mr. F pushed the button in the top tip of the tiller. There we go. The chair shot around the table at breakneck speed, stopped in front of the window with such suddenness that Mr. F was plunged headfirst out of the chair, out through the open window, and a shower of blue sparks followed the trail of the chair as the brush rubbed on the mesh ceiling. There, said Mr. F, climbing back through the window out of breath and with a most distressed look on his face. You can see that this is hardly what might, one might call an improvement in living rooms. Why don't they slow them down a bit, I asked. The scientists who designed these infernal machines insist that they could slow them down. But Mr. and Mrs. M have had so many sad experiences, such as shocks or bumps, in the room that they refuse to have electric chairs of any sort. M1 and M2 are crazy about them, however. The room has been turned over to them and their playroom has been made into a living room for Mr. and Mrs. M. All of the children on the island spend many hours a day driving the easy chairs around the room, yelling and screaming and bumping into each other. The couch holds about four children and is the fastest in the room. I would hate to predict what will become of this younger, mechanically-minded generation. I agree that the electrical age we were entering was indeed frightening. There's a picture of the kids on the couch. Does it remind you of anything? Like bumper cars, maybe? 
What are the bedrooms belonging to M1 and M2 like, I asked. Are they furnished with beds with continuous sheets, too? No, said Mr. F. After seeing the chairs and tables we installed in the dining room, they design beds of their own. Their beds have levers on them, and they move up and down. The rooms have skylights. Like the upstairs rooms in most Moroccan houses, they can move their beds up to the ceiling and look through the skylights at the stars, or they can open the skylights and move right up on the roof on hot nights. A little over the height of the roof is as far up as they go. On the other hand, they can lower their beds right through the floor of their bedrooms into their bathrooms below. We are having a hard time deciding what sort of bed we are going to install in our own houses. The bed with the continuous sheets of Mr. and Mrs. M, or the elevator bed of M1 and M2. Both models have many fine features, you will have to agree. The other rooms in the house have improvements too, such as walls divided into decor decorated revolving panels, which permit a complete change of decor at the press of a button, kitchens with dishwashing and drying machines. The whole house has every imaginable convenience, we believe. I have shown you all of its most spectacular aspects. It leaves me speechless, I muttered. But then as I started thinking it all over, I suddenly exclaimed in a very loud voice, I'm a balloonist, and I must admit this kind of efficiency rather bores me. For instance, I far prefer your stunning and elaborately de elegant Hall of Mirrors dining room to the mechanized mushrooms grove we've just visited. It seems strange to me that mechanical progress always seems to leave the slower demands of elegance far behind. With all of the peace and spare time on this lovely island, why should any part of your lives be speeded up? Many of us are in complete agreement with you, said Mr. F. The artists all are. You are a balloonist. The scientists express themselves through a different medium. If you're interested, I will show you the two remaining innovations we've made on the island. One of them, the balloon merry-go-round, combines the two sports most dependent on nature, ballooning and sailing, and should please you immensely. On the success of the other invention, the lives of the families of Krakatoa depend. I saw your balloon, the globe, and I know you're a balloonist of great ingenuity. I am sure you will like these two balloon inventions. Ladies and gentlemen, announced Professor William Waterman Sherman, before telling you of the two balloon inventions of Krakatoa, I'm going to call a 15 minute intermission. This will give you a chance to digest the many inventions I have already discussed, and it will give me a few moments of rest. The end of my story is, I suppose, the most exciting part. For as you know from having read your newspapers during the last month, the time is near at hand in this account for the lovely island of Krakatoa to start blowing up. Thank you very much for having been such an excellent audience up to this time. Come back in 15 minutes and I'll tell you of two extraordinary inventions and of one history-making explosion. Thank you. The audience spent three of their 15 minutes applauding and cheering and then went outside for a stretch and a breath of fresh air. Professor Sherman poured himself a glass of water, drank it, stretched out on his bed, looked up at the ceiling, and prepared to spend a most comfortable and relaxed intermission. It's a picture of him on his bed. And the rest of the book, we're about two-thirds through it, is even better. I'll see you soon. I love you.